On this Wednesday night, the Prime Minister under oath at the Foreign Interference Inquiry. What Justin Trudeau revealed as he was grilled for hours. There were concerns by CSIS that China might have been behind this. And how he once confronted China's president. The Quebec Premier's referendum ultimatum if the province doesn't get full control over immigration. Why the opposition says he's bluffing. Israel assassinates members of a Hamas leader's family. Where does this leave the path to peace? And from captivity to surviving and thriving. It's probably the single largest ever rescue of endangered bear cubs. The 16 moon bear cubs freed from a life of suffering. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. For the first time, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has testified at the inquiry into foreign meddling in Canadian elections. He has in the past acknowledged foreign interference, especially by the Chinese government, is a serious threat. But ever since Global News and the Globe and Mail broke stories about allegations from sources about foreign meddling, the Prime Minister has faced accusations he did not take that threat seriously enough. The Prime Minister spent several hours on the stand today answering questions about what he knew when. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, was listening. It was Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election that moved Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his cabinet to begin to take steps in 2017 to secure Canada's elections. But it soon became clear that in the Canadian context, Russia would not be the biggest threat, China would be. China has a, a, a very large a diaspora of Chinese Canadians who are uh, often the first uh, targets of interference uh, efforts. Indeed, the inquiry has seen multiple top secret memos from CSIS and other agencies calling China Canada's number one foreign interference threat. And while security agencies in Canada were working to counter that threat, Trudeau confronted China's President Xi Jinping at a summit in 2022 in Indonesia. I mentioned to him that I needed uh, China to stop um, interfering in Canadian democratic processes because that was very much uh, something that uh, people were very concerned about that back home at that particular moment. One alleged incident of Chinese interference that has come up time and again at this inquiry is the 2019 Liberal nomination race in the Toronto area riding of Don Valley North, a race won by Han Dong. Trudeau was first told about CSIS concerns about irregularities in that nomination race in the middle of the 2019 general election. There were clear indications that there were concerns by CSIS that China might have been behind this. But as Trudeau explained, the intelligence was incomplete and in some cases inconclusive. And so, as party leader, he took no action. I didn't feel that there was sufficient or sufficiently credible information. Dong would go on to win the riding in the 2019 general election. Four years later, Global News and the Globe and Mail first reported on these alleged irregularities in that nomination. Global News also reported that Dong had a telephone conversation with a Chinese diplomat in Canada. Global cited national security sources that said in that call, Dong had suggested the release of the two Michaels, then still in captivity, be delayed. Shortly after those reports, Dong resigned from the Liberal caucus and now sits as an independent MP. Dong subsequently sued Global News and rejects the allegations reported by Global. The PM said he was frustrated by the media stories. There were inconsistencies, there were uncorroborated information in the leaks. Uh, there were also things that were flat out wrong. Dong has insisted he always advocated for the early release of the two Michaels. And Dong himself testified at the inquiry that he had not personally seen evidence of Chinese interference. Trudeau testified that he did not take raw intelligence reports on Dong or any other allegations of interference at their face value. Critical thought, he said, must be applied to any information collected by our security and intelligence services. Trudeau also responded to complaints from MP Jenny Kwan and former MP Kenny Chu. Both said they were targets of Chinese interference and both said the government gave them little help. We need to do more. I agree. Now, there is one witness that is going to be recalled, and that is... CSIS Director David Vigneault. He will be back on the stand Friday morning 
And that's because some of the lawyers at the inquiry want him to provide more detail about just what he told the prime minister, verbally or in writing, about the threat of foreign interference. Donna. David in Ottawa, thanks. The Bank of Canada has dropped its strongest hint yet that an interest rate cut could be coming as soon as June. For the sixth time in a row, the central bank kept its benchmark interest rate at 5% today. The bank's governor says he is now seeing the necessary conditions for a cut. Mackenzie Gray explains what those are. If we lower our policy rate too early or cut too fast, we could jeopardize the progress we've made bringing inflation down. That progress has been substantial. Inflation down from 8.1% to 2.8. Enough of a drop to finally start talking about rate cuts. Yes, it's within the realm of possibilities. The short answer is we are seeing what we need to see, but we need to see it for longer to be confident that the progress towards price stability will be sustained. Governor Tiff Macklem also seeing wage growth drop and a softening labor market, two key metrics for the bank. Add in a fresh projection that the Canadian economy will stay out of a recession, and all signs point to cuts. It is very important for the Bank of Canada to cut at the next opportunity, which will be in June. And that likely just won't be in June. Many senior economists believe multiple rate cuts will happen this year. But how far and how fast the central bank goes is still unclear. As they attempt to mitigate risks, including reigniting the housing market, which they said today could see sharp price increases. That increase could be more than we anticipate, and if that were to happen, um, that could put sort of pressure on overall inflation. One thing Tiff Macklem couldn't assess, the impact of the upcoming federal budget, Donna, but he has said before that current government spending levels aren't helping the fight against inflation. Okay, Mackenzie, thanks. In the U.S., expectations of a potential interest rate cut are in doubt because inflation there remains stubbornly high. Consumer price growth accelerated to 3.5 percent in March, the third straight month of growth in the U.S. Just like in Canada, the U.S. Federal Reserve has a 2 percent target for inflation. And if it needs to keep lending rates high, that puts pressure on Canada to do the same. The American president has again sharply criticized Israel's prime minister over his military strategy in Gaza and for failing to allow enough aid into Gaza. It is not making any meaningful difference on the ground. And hopes for a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas were dealt another blow after Israel confirmed it has killed three sons and four grandchildren of the political leader of Hamas. As Jackson Prosco reports, on a day meant for celebrations, Gazans marked the end of Ramadan in the crushing grip of war. In the ruins of a mosque in Rafah, the faithful held prayers for Eid, marking the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. This is the Eid of destruction, not the Eid of joy, says this refugee. Despite hopes the month would usher in a ceasefire, there is only a stalemate. With Israel launching a new wave of airstrikes in Gaza, killing three sons and three grandchildren of the leader of Hamas. While Hamas has reportedly notified Israel that they are unable to track down 40 living hostages needed for a deal. The President of the United States. And in Washington, U.S. President Joe Biden urged both sides to find a solution immediately. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we'll get these hostages home where they belong, but also bring back a six-week ceasefire that we need now. Biden's words have so far not been backed by action, despite his increasingly direct criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I think what he's doing is a mistake. After the Israeli strike that killed seven aid workers, Biden called on his close ally to do everything it can to improve the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Though supplies are moving in more quickly, the United Nations says it's far below the amount needed for humanitarian needs. There's no excuse to not provide for the medical and the, and, the, and, the, and the food needs of those people. They should be done now. Yet Israel is reportedly pushing ahead with a planned offensive in Rafah. The U.S. has not put any conditions on military aid as it warns about what comes next believing Iran or its proxies are on the verge of launching an attack on Israeli soil, deepening American resolve to back its ally. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. 
In Quebec, the opposition is accusing the Premier of bluffing on a threat to hold a referendum on immigration. Yesterday, Premier Francois Legault said he would consider holding a vote on immigration if Prime Minister Justin Trudeau does not cut the number of immigrants coming to Quebec. The leader of the Parti Québécois claims Legault has no intention of following through. So the more you, you say, I might do something, and then you don't do it, the less credibility it has over time. Premier Legault said that in the last eight years, more than half a million asylum seekers, temporary foreign workers and international students have arrived in Quebec, and that, he says, is straining social services and putting the French language at risk. He and the Prime Minister are set to meet on June 30th. Legault wants the number of immigrants coming into the province reduced or for Quebec to be given more power over immigration. Canadians are being warned to brace for an early, stronger wildfire season. In fact, it's already begun in parts of this country. After last year's historic burn, persistent drought conditions and higher than normal temperatures have wildfire officials preparing for the worst. Heather Urix West looks at what's forecast and how those on the front lines are already gearing up. As a new class of wildland firefighter recruits complete their training in Alberta, the fire risk is already at hand. Even in early April, conditions near Hinton, west of Edmonton, are incredibly dry. There's been below average snow levels throughout the winter and that impacts how we're going into this season, but we're also dealing with drought conditions from several years that have accumulated. National forecasters warn this year's wildfire season could begin early. Already the risk is elevated in parts of north central Alberta and southern Ontario and Quebec. By May that risk expands right across the prairies and into interior BC with June and the late summer months seeing the highest risk along BC's south coast. What is clear is that wildfires will, will represent a significant challenge for Canada into the future as the impacts of climate change continue to intensify. As part of Budget 2024, the federal government says it will double the tax credit to support volunteer firefighters. It's also increasing support for Indigenous communities, disproportionately impacted by wildfires and evacuation orders. This year, all 48 First Nations in Alberta will have a funded emergency management coordinator position. This dedicated person will help them coordinate their work to prepare for and to face wildfires. Last season, more than 3,700 members of the Little Red River Cree Nation in northern Alberta were evacuated several times as the Pasqua fire destroyed more than 100 homes. While additional funding is welcome, the community's chief says it's not enough. A lot of communities, either towns and hamlets, have, have opportunities to fight the fires. If, if by chance, if that fire was to roll into the towns and to the hamlets, um, a lot of First Nation communities don't, especially ours. A critical need with fire season now well underway. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Russians are scrambling to help more than 100,000 people displaced by flooding. The rapid spring snowmelt caused several major rivers to overflow, including Europe's third longest. The Ural River burst through a dam over the weekend. Rising flood water has now topped 10 meters in some places and forced residents to pitch tents on their rooftops. Evacuation points have been set up for those arriving by inflatable boat, many fleeing with their pets and just a few belongings. A federal emergency has been declared. This is the worst flooding in Russia in about 70 years. And the deluge extends down to northern Kazakhstan. More than 97,000 people there have been forced to leave their swamp neighborhoods. Residents are racing to shore up dikes and reinforce embankments. The ballooning scrutiny of Boeing coming up. New safety concerns raised by a whistleblower. Former U.S. President Donald Trump says Arizona has gone too far after the state's top court upheld a near-total abortion ban dating back to 1864. Did Arizona go too far? Yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And as you know, it's all about states' rights. That'll be straightened out. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of, I think, very quickly. But Trump also took credit for the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 2022 that overturned Roe v. Wade, the landmark decision that protected abortion access across the U.S. for nearly 50 years. The Arizona Supreme Court ruling on Tuesday clears the way for enforcement of an old law that makes abortion punishable by two to five years in prison, except when a mother's life is at risk.
The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration says it is now investigating new safety allegations about Boeing 787 and 777 wide-body planes after a whistleblower raised concerns that after years in operation, the aircraft could potentially break apart mid-flight. The longtime Boeing engineer is accusing Boeing of taking shortcuts in the construction of the jet, saying sections of fuselages were improperly fastened together and could weaken over time. His concerns, first reported by the New York Times, come after a series of dangerous mid-air mishaps involving Boeing planes in recent months. The company calls the allegations inaccurate, saying they do not represent the comprehensive work Boeing has done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. Ahead, what's stalling Canada's drive to expand its EV battery industry? Supporters cheered as a French woman scaled the Eiffel Tower by rope today. The 34-year-old broke the world rope climbing record, reaching the second floor of the tower, a height of 110 meters, in 18 minutes. She did it to raise money for cancer research. Anu Garnier is also an obstacle course world champion. She'll be an Olympic torchbearer for the upcoming Paris Summer Games. As electric vehicles grow in popularity, there's an opportunity for Canada to access untapped resources. Lithium is a crucial part of the EV industry, and there are huge deposits in this country. But there are major challenges on the road to mining it for batteries. Mike Drolet reports on the drive towards a self-sufficient EV battery supply. Lithium. 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 The buzzword in mining was hard to miss at a recent convention. Everywhere you looked, lithium the key component in electric vehicle batteries. Canada aims to be a player in the lithium industry, but with only two mines in Quebec and Manitoba and less than a 1% share in global production, companies like Frontier Lithium need to get to work. Our objective is not to corner the market or to be the only player. In order for Canada and Ontario to succeed in this, we all have to work together. We have to get as many of these mines up and running as we can. Frontier is sitting on a massive deposit in northwest Ontario, but the only way to get its product out is by ice road. They've applied to the Critical Minerals Infrastructure Fund and are still waiting to get a study completed on a 56-kilometer permanent road. What's at stake? With the road, there will be more jobs, a new refinery, and four times the output. Do we want to watch other people do this, right? And see our auto industry migrate somewhere else because we can't get our act together and get our minerals online and get our processing online? Or do we want to play a big part in this? The federal government has created incentives for mining companies, but has yet to dole them out. And as for red tape holding back projects, they say they're working on it. Well, I think you will be seeing something from us in terms of an action plan about how do we actually cut the timelines but even if approvals are granted, it will be years before the mines are operational and the vision of a self-sufficient battery supply chain is realized. Until then, the supply chain will look something like this. Lithium from South America and Australia, cobalt from Africa and nickel from Indonesia, all shipped to China for refining before arriving at Canadian battery plants. Canada can't rely on that supply chain, particularly uh, because of the environmental damages, but also the, the geopolitical uncertainty. And that's more incentive to get it right. With the dream of a retooled EV-focused automotive sector creating jobs all over the country still very much in reach. We got a lot of hurdles, but I, I'm, I'm feeling it can be done, and I think we've got the smarts to do it. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Rescued and recovering next, the mission to save these endangered moon bear cubs. It was quite the sight in northern Brazil. Crowds of researchers and students gathered to watch the release of endangered sea turtles. 15,000 hatchlings scurried across the sand and into the mouth of the Amazon River on Tuesday. Green sea turtles are endemic to the region, and since 1981, Brazil's Biodiversity and Conservation Program has helped release 179,000 of them. More than a dozen Asiatic black bear cubs are recovering after what conservation officials are calling an historic rescue in Southeast Asia. Known as moon bears, they're often farmed to extract their bile for traditional Chinese medicine. 
Neetu Garcha reports on the rescue and how it's shining a light on an inhumane practice that's plagued the region for decades. Behind the tiny footsteps of these moon bear cubs in Laos and their innocent play is a grim experience of exploitation and cruelty. Rescued from illegal wildlife traders, they're finding solace in the wildlife conservation charity Free the Bears. Extremely young, uh, seemingly purchased illegally from hunters across northern Laos. Late last month, they were discovered in a police raid. Officers found 17 bear cubs, one dead, in a house suspected to be the site of an illegal wildlife trade operation. Most likely to try and establish a bear bar farm. Free the Bear CEO Matt Hunt described it as one of the largest ever rescues of endangered bear cubs worldwide. He says these cubs face a daunting future. Hand raised by people, they'll likely require lifelong care within the sanctuary walls. We've been working with the Lao government for over 20 years, uh, trying to ensure that uh, bear bile farming isn't allowed to become established here. Across Asia, thousands of animals are caged and mutilated to extract their bile for use in costly traditional medicine. These cubs serve as a beacon of resilience, inspiring us all to protect our wildlife. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Muslims around the world are celebrating Eid al-Fitr, the festival of breaking the fast, which marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan. And we leave you tonight with prayers and celebrations of Eid from around the world. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.